And let me extend a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are here. Uh, you are special to us. I know you're special to others. I trust that you'll have a very special day together with family. As God would have it, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3 today. So if you open your Bibles with me, we're looking at the first seven verses. Having spent time, really as he started the book of Peter, he spends so much time dealing with people that are under persecution and just encouraging them with the wonder of their salvation. All the way through the first chapter into the second chapter, and we get to the middle part of the second chapter, verse 11 and 12, he makes a transition and starts talking about relationships. He talks about relationships in general that we as believers have with the lost world. He gets more specific, though, in verse 13, and I think through about verse 17 or so, he gets very specific about our relationship to government and how we're supposed to respond. In the verses that follow 18 to 20, he speaks of our relationship with masters, or we would, in our modern context, apply that to our employers. And now as we come to chapter 3, he focuses in on our home life. And really, the primary relationship of our home life, and that is the relationship between husband and wife. And so, um, I was always told you're supposed to preach a sweet message on Mother's Day. I don't know if this is sweet or not, but it is biblical. Okay, And so that, to me, is most important. That we have, as we just sung, the text we sang, should draw our hearts to have homes that are thoroughly founded on the Word of God, where... We desire to live what the Bible says. I think as many of us approach to marriage, those of us that are married, or if you're still approaching marriage, we approach it with a very idealistic mindset. We think of that perfect spouse, you know, the, the wife that just is always enthralled with everything you do. Everything you do as a man is just exciting to her. <laughs> And there are still a few of us that still have that ideal. <laughs> or conversely, the, the woman thinking of a guy that just caters to her every whim and bows to her every need. Okay, <laughs> I was waiting for that. And that continues. It continues through the dating period. It continues through the engagement period many times. But at some point... Many times, reality sinks in. Somehow, the man has all these habits that he hid so skillfully during the engagement period. And the wife really doesn't care about some of the outstanding abilities that her husband has, though he thinks they're outstanding. And even in our Christian marriages, our relationship can sour to a point where it's nowhere close to what we dreamed or what we had hoped for. In some cases, the relationship really gets very hostile. In many cases, in some cases, it even falls apart. I believe as we look at our text this morning, we're going to find the portrait of a perfect marriage. What does God expect or what is necessary for us to have the marriage that God intended for us to have? And so let's look at our text this morning. Let's read it from 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 to 7. It says, Likewise... Ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God of great price, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And so as we look at this text this morning, we find some instruction that I believe is very helpful for us. I think the reason that many of our marriages fail today is because we have a completely wrong focus. We have the focus of our relationship wrong. We dream of this relationship, and it's all about who? It's all about us. It's all about me. And so the focus is entirely 
selfish. And the reality is for a relationship like a marriage relationship to be successful, each spouse must be selflessly committed to the other. And I think that's where we fail. We fail to properly submit to one another as husband and wife. We have a relationship that is essentially the combination of two very self-centered people. And then you add children, selfish children to the mix. And you have a home that is filled with conflict. Because when you have selfish people, you're going to have conflict. God is the author of marriage. And he has designed the relationship to be a certain way. And there are principles he's given us to follow. And I believe we find that in his word this morning. I believe they'll be very helpful to us. Before we enter that, because it does deal with us laying aside our selfishness, I think it's appropriate for us to pray and ask for God's help to understand it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. We thank you for the marriage relationship that you have given to give companionship to the man by one woman. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that your word gives us very clear instruction on how to carry that out, both as man and wife. Lord, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you would help us to carefully evaluate our lives, to see whether we are conducting ourselves, that our focus is what it should be in the relationship that you've given. Lord, you, I pray that you give us help. Help me as I speak to say those things that are clear and plain that you would speak through your spirit to us from your word and help us to walk away from here with tangible ways that we can improve the relationship that you have given us. Or for those that are not married here, that maybe are anticipating marriage, I pray that you'd help them to understand the principles that are so important for them to have the right kind of marriage. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to begin partly in the way that Peter begins this and talk about really the fact that a godly marriage requires mutual submission. A godly marriage requires mutual submission. And you may be thinking, now, wait a minute. It's the wife that's supposed to be submissive. Well, clearly, Peter does talk about that as a theme that he has been on. I've already mentioned that he talked about our relationship to government. If you notice in 1 Peter 2.13, if you have your text there, it says, Submit yourselves there to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So here's really where he begins this concept of submission. He continues that in verse 18, and he says of chapter 2, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. He begins what we call chapter 3 of his letter, with likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. And then in verse 7, notice how he starts with the husbands. He says, likewise, ye husbands, in the same way, ye husbands. I don't believe he stopped talking about this concept of submission. And the reason I believe that is when you look at the other instruction in Scripture, particularly as it relates to the marriage relationship, we find that a relationship requires mutual submission to one another. The Apostle Paul, in Ephesians chapter 5, begins his very important discussion about marriage with this verse, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. And so I believe that we have, in the marriage relationship, responsibility both as husbands and wives, to be submissive. Now, those look different. And we want to talk about those individually this morning. So let's begin with, as Peter does, the role of wife in submission. The role of wife in submission. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection in your own husbands. What does that word mean? It's the word that means to arrange under, to subject yourself. It's the same word he's used for being in line with authority for a government and with your masters, to be in, to be in obedience to. Uh, To use it very literally, as a military term, it means to arrange under your commander. If you're in the military, you are trained from the very beginning to be obedient to the leadership that you have over you, to fall in rank under your commander. And that's the idea that this word meant in the original language in a very literal sense. In a non-military sense, it is a voluntary attitude of giving in, of cooperating, of assuming responsibility and carrying a burden. So, For us, in this context, it would mean to bring yourself under the authority of someone or something. And so, as we look at the wife's responsibility in marriage, we understand that a wife is to submit to her husband by being in line 
with the authority that God has given to him. The perfect picture of that is the passage we know in Ephesians chapter 5, where Christ is the head of the church and the church is the bride. The church submits itself to Christ. Let me read it for you. Ephesians 5, 22. It's a familiar passage. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as Christ, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Christ is head. He has the authority over the church. And that's the same role that we find in the marriage relationship. The wife should so love her husband that she's willing to submit to his authority, just as we, the church, love Christ and submit to his authority. And God is the one that established this authority structure. We find it at the very beginning of the book of Genesis. After the fall, we find God telling Adam and Eve, even telling Eve, thy desire shall be to thy husband, but he shall rule over thee. And so our culture, though our culture today is one that likes to write off things that Peter says and Paul says as being specific to the culture, it's not true. It was established by God when he directed the, uh, the role of man and wife in the marriage relationship. Our society believes that a wife should not be restricted by the authority of her husband, that that's too restricting. They should be free and liberated. An illustration I've used before, it's not unique with me, um, is the concept of a train. Is a train free if it is not on its track? If we were to pull out of the parking lot today and in the middle of Roselle Road there was a locomotive sitting there, most of, us, most of us would recognize that it is not supposed to be there. There'd be a few kids that go, cool, a train. And maybe some adults would want to go see it too, but a train is only free when it operates in the environment that it's designed to operate in. It cannot operate on Roselle Road. It can operate on a track. And the author of this illustration puts it this way. Freedom in God's world never comes apart from structure. When one is free to live as God intended, he is truly free indeed. And so God's plan is for the wife to live in line with the authority of her husband. Notice the focus. It's her own husband. And that would have been very significant. It's significant to us today, but it would have been very significant in the first century when there may have been many wives who had lost husbands that didn't even come to church and perhaps didn't even know what it meant to be a believer. And so here the apostle says, even in that case, you are to live in subjection to your own husband. And so the role of the wife means that she understands that really the husband bears the ultimate responsibility in the home and she's willing to have that. She's okay with that. And so really our first question this morning then is, ladies, those of you that are wives, are you okay with that? Do you function in that way? Are you fulfilling your role? Are you living in line with your husband's authority? Or is your relationship one where you are constantly struggling over the decisions he's making? Notice it doesn't say if your husband is really bright and always makes the best possible decision, then line up under his authority. Do husbands always make the best possible decision? No. We're men of flesh. We have our own idiosyncrasies, right? We have things we're all hung up on. And yet, God says, line up under their authority, just as I've designed. How about the example, wives, that you're presenting to your daughters, if you have daughters, or to your sons, if you have sons? Are you portraying to them what a godly wife looks like? So when they go out and commit matrimony someday, they have an understanding of what the role of the wife is supposed to be. They understand it very clearly because they've seen mom model it. I hope you are. And so the role of the wife in submission is to respond and be in line with her husband's God-given authority. All right, guys, now it's our turn. Notice the role of the husband in submission Notice what it says in verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Husbands, in the same way, we have a responsibility to submit as well. It is a different role, but it is a role nonetheless. And that is a role where we are to be responding to the needs of our wife. 
You see, we also find in Ephesians 5 that the husband's role is pictured by the self-sacrifice of Christ. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ sacrificially gave himself for the church. What was the greatest need that we had before we were part of the church, before we were part of believers? Our greatest need was to be forgiven of our sin, the violation of God's command. And the only way that could be taken care of was through the sacrifice of Christ. There's nothing that we could do. Our need was redemption. And Christ provided that. Husbands, your role is to be giving yourself sacrificially to your wife. That means putting her first. That means you're subordinating your needs to the needs that she has and serving her. I'm not talking about, sometimes we hear this, well, I've got a 50-50 relationship with my wife. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about saying, okay, husband, you abdicate your role of authority. No, what I'm saying is you are a godly servant leader. God made you the leader, but he didn't make you the dictator. He made you a servant leader. You see, this is the exact picture that Christ gave to us. The apostles, the disciples didn't get it. When they were walking with Christ, they wanted to be made part of his kingdom. In fact, two of them, one of the accounts in the New Testament says a mother came to them and said, Hey, can you make my sons have the place of sitting on your right hand and your left hand in your kingdom? Because I want them to have power. And how did Christ respond to that? He said it this way. It's Matthew chapter 20. Christ called them unto him and said, "Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Whosoever shall be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. See, leadership and authority in God's kingdom are exercised By selflessly serving those over which you have authority. Guys, let me read that for you again. Leadership and authority in God's kingdom are exercised by selflessly serving those over whom you have authority. So that means we submit as husbands by properly responding to the needs of your wife, serving them. The opposite of that is selfishness. It's all about me. It's all about having my needs met. It's all about what I want. When I come home, clear the path because dad is home and he's in charge. Give me the chair and the clicker and get off the Wii because it's my turn on the LCD. I didn't even think about that one in advance. That is not the picture that you see here. Of a servant serving the wife. You see what I mean about relation to this this submission being mutual? Yes, the wife has a responsibility to respond to your authority, husband. But your authority means now you serve her as a self-sacrificing servant. That requires submission. That means when you walk in the door, it's not about getting to the chair, the clicker, and whatever channel you're going to watch. It's about finding out what she needs help with. Maybe you beat her home. Guess what? Your dinner. You're on the phone. Hey, hon, what's for dinner? Okay, I can cook that. All right, I'll get it started for you. It's very silent in here. Hey, hon, I need you to stop by the grocery store and get groceries. Could you do the Sam's run this week? Because I'm tired and I need some help. Those are just little things. Little things. If you have young children, there are... A host of other things that you can do to serve your wife and demonstrate servant leadership. Husbands, how are you doing? Would your wife say this morning, wow, I do have that ideal husband. That dream of an ideal marriage has not faded in my mind because I've got a husband that serves me. Not perfect. I know that. But he serves me. He's willing to help me. He's willing to put my needs ahead of his own in tangible and real ways. Are you helping your wife succeed as a mother? Are you helping her succeed as a godly woman? Now, what about your sons? Do your sons see what it means to be 
the right kind of husband. When they become a husband someday by God's grace, will they go, you know what? I want to treat my wife just the way dad did. Because he did it right. What about your daughters? Are you demonstrating for them the kind of man they need to be looking for? Are you demonstrating for them the kind of a godly husband and what it should look like? And so the role of the husband in submission is to respond to the needs of his wife by being a servant leader to her. As husbands and wives, we must be submitting ourselves to one another in the fear of God. Now, Peter doesn't stop there. He goes on and gives us a little bit more detail about how this works and what it looks like, both for the husband as well as for the wife. And so let's start by looking at the wife as he does at the first part of this text and recognize that a godly wife yields to her husband. And in doing that, he answers really two key questions, I believe. One is, how, does that, how is that submission demonstrated? And then what does it accomplish or what is the outcome? So let's look at some ways in which this submission is demonstrated. I think there are at least three of them in the text. You might find more, but I have found three. We find the first one in verse 2. A wife's submission is demonstrated by her behavior that is godly and respectful. A wife's submission is demonstrated by her behavior that is godly and respectful. Notice verse 2. Behold, they, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, we understand the word conversation there is not talking about just the words. It's really talking about our, our whole outward behavior, our conduct, the manner of living, how we behave. And so it's evident from how a woman is responding to her husband that she is demonstrating this kind of submission. It's observable by her words, by her actions, not only to her husband, but to others. Notice the descriptive words he uses. He uses the idea of this word chaste. It means pure, immaculate, innocent, perfect, clean. It's talking about a purity of character, the conduct of a godly woman. That which work the Holy Spirit does inside a person's life. He says it's also coupled with fear or reverence or respect. And, you know, you could say, well, that she has to have this reverential awe of her husband. And really, I think the idea here is more likely that her reverence is of God who gave her husband the authority. And because of who God is, she's willing to be submissive to him. She's living a pure life, a life that's in fear of the Lord and what he has established. Ladies, Wives, is your conduct pure, innocent, respectful? Or are you, is your home really about a war that you're carrying on with your husband at this point? Notice also in verses 3 and 4 that a wife's submission is not only demonstrated by her behavior that's godly and respectful, but it's also demonstrated by her focus. Her focus is on internal beauty and not just external beauty. Notice verses 3 and 4. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold or putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. Now, I don't believe that that Peter is saying here you just just ignore the outside completely and, and just look as homely as you possibly can as long as you have a great personality. I don't believe that's what he's saying. And quite frankly, the grammar would say that as well. It's essentially he's saying when you compare the two, what is your focus? In other words, is your focus all about what you look like on the outside? Um, the language that he uses is interesting. The, the plating or plaiting or braiding of the hair is not simply just wearing braids, but it was talking about a something that was professionally done. It was a hairdo that was... Exquisite. I mean, it was something that was held together with perhaps costly jewelry, combs and things. And the idea of jewelry wasn't just having an earring or two, but just an abundance of jewelry. And even putting on of apparel seems to imply a great variety of apparel and perhaps even frequently changing that. In other words, this is the picture here is of someone that's all about the external. Her makeup is just precise. Her accessories are exquisite and her dress is Just perfect. It matches her color and all those things. And I don't think he's saying ignore those, but he's saying, you know what? What's more important is to not be so absorbed with what you look like on the outside, but be absorbed with what you are on the inside. Notice the qualities that of a meek and quiet spirit. Meekness is a humble, gentle attitude, a quiet or still tranquil spirit. 
which is the exact opposite of a noisy spirit, a boisterous spirit, someone that's constantly in your face. And so this meek and quiet spirit is precious in the sight of God. And I'll tell you, it's precious in the sight of your husband. Proverbs chapter 21, Solomon knew this, said this, It's better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Ten verses later, he said, It's better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. A couple of passages later in chapter 27, he says, A constant dripping of a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. A meek and quiet spirit are special to God and they are special to your husband. And that should be your focus. Again, not ignoring health, not ignoring what you look like, but that should not be your primary focus. Your internal spirit, what you, how you respond. And so what does that look like? If we had the privilege of having um, you know, one of those video cameras that go around, is that reality TV, is that what it's called? If we had Bethel reality TV this morning... Um, We probably all would be ashamed, would we not? Ladies, how would that look and how you responded to your husband this week? Are you nurturing a meek and quiet spirit? Or are you constantly critical and complaining about all that he does? He needs help, right? He does need help. But even help can be provided in a meek and quiet manner. And so a wife's submission is also demonstrated by her focus. It's internal. It's on internal beauty. Also notice, interesting, how what he says in verses 5 and 6, that a wife's submission is demonstrated by her desire to follow the example of other godly women. Notice it says, For after this manner, the, the, the old time, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God and adored themselves, being in subjection of their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. In other words, Peter says there's a way that we can look. We can look at other examples. We can look at the Old Testament and the scriptures and see women that responded correctly. Those that adorned themselves in a meek and quiet way. Those that were respectful and submissive to their husbands. Even in cases where it was potentially fearful to do so. Paul tells us in the book of Titus. He gives this instruction to the mature woman. He says the aged women likewise, that, that they be in behaviors becoming holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, I know there's not a lady here tonight today that wants to be considered in that aged category. I understand that. But the reality is, all of us have people that are younger and older than us. We're, we're all, we all have people that are the same age. We have people on either side of us in terms on this walk of life. And we can all learn from some, and we can all teach others. And that's what we should be about. If we're concerned about being the wife that God desires, then you should be seeking to grow in your obedience. What are you doing to grow? Are you reading books that help you understand how to be a more godly wife? Are you... Looking for other women that are doing that, that perhaps are older than you, that are perhaps have their children out of the home already, that you can seek counsel from them. Are you willing to be a help to a younger wife? Some of the young ladies in our ministry that have just been married, are you willing to help them? And so I believe a wife's submission is also demonstrated by her desire to follow others. And so what does it look like? It looks like a wife that is conducting herself in a pure and respectful way. She's demonstrating her submission by focusing on inner beauty and by willing to seek the examples of others. Notice the outcome right there at the beginning of the passage. He gives us the outcome in verse 1. He talks about, he talks about men that are not obedient to the word, that they may also be won without a word by the conversation, by the conduct of the wife. And essentially what he's saying is if you have a husband that is disobedient, in particular one that's not even a believer, That by your conduct, by your proper submission and your focus on your inner beauty, you have the opportunity to win them. To show them what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. I've had the privilege of of talking to women, uh, counseling women whose husband is not a believer or perhaps is a a believer that's not being obedient to the Lord. And, And this is a key passage in the sense that we need to make sure that our life communicates that. Quite frankly, it would be true also of a husband whose wife is lost, that he can not only with words, but also in how he serves her, can reflect the gospel of Christ. 
And so the outcome is an amazing outcome, one that can point them, even with a nonverbal testimony, to what God has done in their lives. So wives, I trust that you're certain today or that you'll consider today that you're demonstrating this role of submission by having that right kind of conduct, pure and respectful, that your focus is on the inner beauty and that you're living the testimony of a spirit filled Christian. Let's talk a little about the husband as we conclude today. God, a godly husband serves his wife. And again, I think we have here in this passage not only how it's demonstrated, but also why it's necessary. So let's look at the demonstration of servant leadership. He says, first of all, that a husband's servant leadership is demonstrated by his efforts to understand his wife. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. Or in other words, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. We must have an understanding of our wives. It's, it's um, something that we know about our wives. We must recognize their needs and respond in the right way. Now, I can tell by how some of you are looking at each other, you're saying that is absolutely impossible. I've also learned that some of the terminology that ladies use is very difficult for us to understand. So, gentlemen, I have a brief glossary of some words here that may be helpful to you. The first word is the word fine. Oh, you you know what that means? That's the word that women use to end an argument when they are right. And you need to be quiet. Then there's the word nothing. What is wrong, dear? Nothing. That always means something. It does not mean nothing. It means something. And the arguments usually begin with nothing and end with fine. (laughs) Then there's this little phrase, go ahead. That's a dare. It's not permission. (laughs) Don't do it. I got got two more for you. There's a loud sigh. Now, that's not actually a word, but it's often misunderstood. The loud sigh usually means that she knows that you're an idiot. And she's wondering why you're wasting your time standing there arguing with her about nothing. And then there's the most dangerous statement that a woman can make to a man. That's okay. That means she wants to think long and hard before she decides how you will pay for your mistake. (laughs) All kidding aside, we understand as men that it is difficult. And I hope women, I hope you understand as a wife that it is very difficult for us to do what the Bible commands us to do in this case. Live with your wife in an understanding way. That means we need to know you. And we need to know how you think. And it is very difficult. And yet, God does not give us commands that we cannot fulfill. God says, understand, live with your wife in an understanding way. That means there is an ability, as His grace provides, for you to do that. What does that require of you, husbands? It requires you to learn those things, those idiosyncrasies about your wife. He said, you know what? It would have been great if my father-in-law had just given me like a handbook or something that kind of came with the package. You get the woman and this book, and the book has all the stuff in it that tells you how to understand her and how to figure her out. Actually, she did come with an owner's manual and it's just right here. It's in her heart. And it's your job to learn that and to figure that out. To spend time drawing that out of her, to understand her, to learn what she's interested in, what her wants are, what what her desires are, what her purposes are. It's your job, husband, to become really a lifelong student of your wife. One thing I have learned in the years that I've been with my wife, is that it's, it's, it, you constantly are learning. And that's a great thing. It means that marriage is never dull. Because you can never say, I've got it all figured out, right? You're constantly learning and growing together. And you're better able to do exactly what Scripture says by serving her in a way that's understanding. I've been warned about not saying anything about my family today. I'm going to violate that. I happen to know my wife hates going to Sam's. She just 
Not that she hates Sam's. She just doesn't like that store. She doesn't like going in there. It's no big deal. I, so I'm the Sam's guy. I, I do the Sam's run. And that's a way that I can help her. I understand that. She doesn't like getting groceries either. I try to tell her I'll do the groceries, but she doesn't trust me with that part. <laughs> Which is probably wise. We'll come home with all kinds of fancy hot sauces and stuff like that that are totally impractical. There are things that, what do we need to understand? We need to understand our wives' physical needs. We understand, Peter says in this text, that she is the weaker vessel. It doesn't mean she's intellectually weaker or she's just mentally weaker. She's physically weaker. We understand that. And as men, we need to understand that and respond to those needs. Watch, watch her physical exertion and step in the way when you need to and say, you need to rest some. Let me help you. We need to understand her spiritual needs. How is she, where is she struggling spiritually? Where's the things that you could be reminding her and teaching her? What books can you be recommending for her to read and study? You need to understand her personal needs. You know, we can come home and not say a word all evening as men, and that is fine. That is generally not fine for your wife. She wants you to talk to her. You need that. She needs that. Especially if she's a stay-at-home mom and she's been talking to toddlers all day. She hasn't had a sane conversation all day. And she needs one with you. So recognize that. Think that when you walk in the door. She's been with three in diapers all day and I need to talk with her. Recognize that need. Notice also a husband's servant leadership is demonstrated in the manner in which he honors his wife. Notice verse 7. Giving honor unto the wife as being heirs together of the grace of life. The word honor there is an interesting word. It's the word that means to prize, to count as precious. Peter has used a similar word in chapter 1 and verse 19 when he talked about the precious blood of Christ. Giving honor, holding her as precious to you. He says here we recognize that by looking at her position, we understand that she's a joint heir of the grace of life. In other words, in God's eyes, both husband and wife are joint heirs, if they're believers, to eternal life. All right? And so he's not placing one above the other. There's an equality there. We honor our wives with our attitudes toward her. We're tender. We accept advice and, and, and criticism from her where necessary. We admit our offenses and seek forgiveness. We praise her publicly in front of others and in front of the family. We show her that she is first place in our heart. We protect her from offense, from others, and even from the children. And so the question is, husbands, are you a lifelong student of your wife? Young men that are yet to be married recognize that when you enter into that relationship, that you have that obligation. It's not like you just get to know her when you're dating and then it's done. It's it's far from done. It's only just begun. If you're going to be a servant leader, then you will be learning her your entire life so that you can be the best possible servant. You, can be, you guys do that in your careers, right? You go through training. You go to week-long training sessions. Why? So that you can be the best that you can be in your job. How come we don't apply that to our marriage where we're seeking to know our wives so well that we anticipate her needs and can respond to them? Notice the outcome right at the end of verse 7 there. The outcome is that your prayers be not hindered. In other words, this, this instruction is significant because it has a potential spiritual impact on the husband and that your prayers aren't going to get answered if you are not responding correctly. The idea of having your prayers hindered is literally that of a cut off. And therefore, this is an instruction we must take very seriously. Does your prayer life husband reflect that? Your prayers are hitting the ceiling. They're not getting through because you're not being the servant to your wife that you need to be. You know, we can have a perfect marriage. We can have that. It's going to take work. It's going to take submission. A wife responding to a husband's authority and a husband then also serving his wife and learning her. I trust that that will be the case. It seems that our culture is at war with marriage as God has defined it. It's been an interesting week in that, that respect. Even our president doesn't understand 
biblical marriage. He doesn't understand marriage. God designed it. This is not something we just made up. It's the core of how we were created. God made man and he said, it is not good for him to be alone. So I will make a woman to be his suitable helper, his proper companion. And they will live in a relationship that we've called marriage that requires mutual submission. Let's pray.